We thank you, our gracious Father, as we have been thinking all this evening for the death of the the Lord Jesus. And we pray now that as we uh, come to listen to what Luke has to tell us about that great event, we pray that you would open our minds to understand. Please teach us and speak to us and uh, grow us in our confidence and in our joy in all that Jesus has done for us. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Good. Well, um, our question this evening uh, for us is this. Uh, The question is, why is the death of Jesus uh, central to the Christian message? Why is the death of Jesus central to the Christian message? message. If we've been Christians uh, for any length of time, I guess that we know that it is. Uh, If you're a guest uh, uh, this evening, uh, uh, let me say, as Ruth said, that it's great uh, that you're here uh, with us. Uh, Let me tell you on behalf of your friends who brought you here that it is the death of Jesus Christ that they really want to tell you about. Okay, uh, so uh, if, if, if what I say this evening doesn't really do anything for you, uh, make sure you ask them about it afterwards. Uh, because there is no doubt that right from the beginning of the Christian faith, the death of Jesus on that cross, uh, 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 on that first Good Friday, has been the heart of the Christian message. In fact, the uh, the New Testament uh, can summarize that message very simply as Christ and him crucified. Uh, And uh, that is what the apostles preached all over the ancient Mediterranean world. Uh, That is what missionaries down the centuries uh, learned foreign languages and took off uh, for some pretty brutal places so that they could tell people that they found there about Jesus' crucifixion. And in fact, it is uh, what led to the founding of the modern student Christian Union movement in this country. I I, I gather that there's been a student uh, weekend away here uh, uh, um, this weekend. Um, uh, And uh, some of us here are students. Many more of us uh, perhaps have been so in the past. Uh, But did you know that the organization uh, now known as the University and Colleges Christian Fellowship, UCCF, Uh, was formed off the back of a clash just over 100 years ago in 1910 between the student Christian movement, the SCM, and the Cambridge Intercollegiate Christian Union, the KICQ. And when after the First World War, the SCM thought that they ought to try to uh, heal this rift, um, uh, the problem was that when it came to what they thought about the death of Jesus, they were happy, they said, to acknowledge it and to say that it had a place in their message, Uh, but not that it was central. And the then president of the KICQ, a man called uh, Norman Grubb, Uh, You just don't get names like that anymore, sadly. Um, But uh, Norman Grubb insisted that that wasn't good enough and that it had to be front and centre in the message they wanted to hold out to others. And interestingly, over the following years, the SCM largely uh, died out, uh, but from the ministry of the KICQ came uh, the the InterVarsity Fellowship and what is now called UCCF. And so the apostles, right at the beginning, the missionaries to the nations, the leaders of Christian unions, why did they all hold the death of Jesus to be at the very heart, at the very center of the Christian message? Well, I hope you can see the relevance um, of this question for us. Uh, This, of course, is not just something uh, of historical um, interest. As Christians, we are people, aren't, aren't we, who, uh, uh, who trust personally in the death of, of Jesus. And in our better moments, uh, we want to share the gospel about him with uh, others. Uh, in fact, in, in just a few weeks' time, uh, we have Passion for Life uh, outreach uh, events happening here, I think, and indeed all over the country. 
a tremendous opportunity to tell our, our friends, our neighbors, our city uh, about Jesus. And so why is it uh, when there is, as we know, so much going on in the world uh, right now that requires our attention and compassion, why is it that we are wanting to talk about a man dying on a cross 2,000 y- years ago? Well, our passage this evening in Luke chapter 22 provides us with the uh, glorious answer. And it is an answer that Luke, our gospel writer, thought that the Christian believer he is writing his gospel for, a man called uh, Theophilus, um, Luke thought that he needed, Theophilus needed, to be certain about it. Uh, In fact, Luke writes his whole uh, gospel uh, to give Theophilus certainty about Jesus and a particular um, kind of certainty, certainty uh, about or uh, or, um, certainty that in the things that Jesus has done and achieved, God's great Old Testament promises have come true and gone live, we might say. And Luke um, has this interesting assumption that um, we might do do well to to, to ponder, um, really. Um, Luke assumes that as Theophilus becomes more confident and he gives him greater certainty uh, that what we have in Jesus really is the great promises of God come true, um, Uh, that Theophilus then will both be more able and also more eager to play his part in the great task of proclaiming Jesus to the nations of the world. But of course, for this to work for us, um, we need to know a bit about God's Old Testament promises. So um, uh, here here we go. Uh, Perhaps the key promise that God had made was that one one day he himself would show up on earth on the dusty uh, streets of ancient Israel in the person of his chosen king, and his king would pull off once and for all the great rescue that God knows that his world really needs. Um, And uh, it it is a rescue, of course, not in the first instance um, from viruses, or from people called Vladimir, uh, but a rescue from our own sin and from his own righteous anger. So that people from all the nations all over the world might know the, the joy of being rightly related to him forevermore, and into eternity. That is that is some promise, isn't it? That God had made. And this passage uh, tells us very simply, really, but very uh, importantly, that the reason why the death of Jesus is and always should be uh, central to the Christian message is because the death of Jesus is that great rescue, that great work of salvation that God promised. It looks a bit different from perhaps um, what maybe we thought that it would. Uh, But Luke wants us to know it really is the great work of salvation that God has done for his world. Three points then uh, for us uh, this evening. I think they're going to come up on the uh, 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 screen. Uh, Three things that Luke wants to draw our attention to to prove this to us. And the first is the plot um, that will lead to Jesus' death, the plot or or the conspiracy uh, of the chief priests and, and, and so on. And Luke wants us to know, here is the stitch up that God predicted. The plot against Jesus' life, here is the stitch up that God had predicted. Now, I I realize that this may uh, surprise us slightly, so let's just begin with the easy bit and with the fact that it clearly is a stitch-up. Okay, so verse 1, Luke 22, verse 1. Now, the festival of unleavened bread called the Passover was uh, was approaching, 
And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And then you'll see we have a visit uh, to the chief priests. We have conversations, let's, let's call them that. Uh, betrayal, money, changing hands, Jesus' fate being sealed. And uh, even for us in our day, when we are not totally unfamiliar, are we, with dodgy dealings in high religious and political places, um, this is pretty dark, isn't it? Uh, Here is corruption of the highest order in the highest of places. Here then is the stitch up. But Luke says that it is a stitch-up that remarkably, hundreds of years before, God himself had predicted and prophesied. And Luke drops us a number of hints about this um, that get less and less uh, subtle. So um, hint number one, you'll see, is that this happens when the Passover was approaching. Uh, the, 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 the plot, the conspiracy doesn't happen just at any time. Uh, it happens at this particular time. We'll come back to that uh, in just a moment. Hint number two is that if you look down to verse 21, uh, you'll see that Jesus not only knows all about this betrayal thing, uh, but he is allowing it to happen and makes no effort to, uh, to, to, to prevent it from doing so. And hint number three, which um, is not really a, a hint, it is a sort of slap in the face of obvious sort of thing, um, is, verse, is that the reason Jesus uh, allows the betrayal to happen is, verse 22, the Son of Man will go, he says, as it has been decreed decreed not by the chief priests, not by uh, uh, Judas, but decreed by God. Jesus will be betrayed because God decreed and predicted that it should be so. Now, we could turn to a number of places in the Old Testament to uh, see this. We could, uh, we could go to Psalm 118, uh, which the crowd... Uh, sang to Jesus just three chapters ago as he entered um, as he entered Jerusalem. Psalm 118 speaks of God's chosen king being a stone that will be rejected by his own people. We could go um, to the very passage that we read for us uh, earlier, I- Isaiah 53. Do you remember where we read that the suffering servant of the Lord uh, will be the victim of injustice and of oppression. We could uh, even see in Psalm 41 a prophecy of the king being stabbed in the back by one of his close friends. Now, we could ponder for a moment how all of these things relate to God's Sovereignty. And the answer, in brief, is, yep, don't worry, it does. Uh, that uh, God is so sovereign that he uses even the, uh, the evil things that people do in order to accomplish his own purpose. But what Luke really wants us to notice is that what we have here is not just religious hypocrisy and naked greed, although obviously we do. What we have, Luke says, is exactly the murky and ugly backdrop on which God had said long before that he would paint his masterpiece of salvation. The plot. Luke wants us to know, here is the stitch-up that God had predicted. Secondly, second piece of evidence uh, uh, Luke uh, gives us is the date, the date at which all these things happen. And the point Luke wants us to see is here 
Here is the sacrifice that God had pledged. Here is the sacrifice that God had pledged. I wonder if you noticed um, all the way through um, as we read that um, Luke keeps on pointing us to the calendar and the time of year. Did you notice that? Verse uh, 1, the festival of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching. Verse 7, then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be uh, sacrificed. And then verse uh, uh, 14, just very briefly, when the hour came. And uh, verse 8, it is the Passover meal that Jesus sends Peter and John to get uh, ready. In fact, the reason why, verse uh, um, um, 8 still, um, it is only they who meet the man with the water jar and uh, the reason why the directions to the upstairs room are distributed only on a need-to-know basis. Uh, The reason for that is so that Judas will not know in advance where Jesus will be so that Jesus will not be arrested too early. The dates and even the times of day, Luke says, they really matter. And they matter, of course, because this is the moment in the Jewish year when sweet, white, Woolly lambs are wandering around every house in the city, and when probably the the dads in those houses are sharpening some very long knives uh, that will soon stain the aforementioned white fleeces um, in a dark reddish maroon colour. Because um, Passover, of course, was for the Jews um, uh, a mixture of Independence Day and Remembrance Day. It was the 4th of July and the 11th of of November rolled into one. It was the time of year when they remembered, when they celebrated how hundreds of years before God had rescued them from being slaves in Egypt. The great exodus, you remember. The plague on the firstborn son had stopped Pharaoh in his tracks, let's call it that, and the Passover lamb had been killed as a sacrifice in the place of the Israelite firstborn son. And so Passover meant blood shed in sacrifice. The lamb was sacrificed, the son was spared, the people were freed. It was the great event in the history of God's people. And yet it wouldn't always be, because later on, God insisted that the day was coming of a greater exodus, of a greater rescue, a rescue for which God himself would provide the ultimate sacrifice. The prophet Isaiah, of course, we read this earlier. The prophet Isaiah had had spoken of how this time, extraordinarily, the lamb that has the knife stuck in it will actually be a human. In fact, he would actually be the servant of the Lord, led like a lamb to the slaughter as a sacrifice for the sins of his people. And no wonder then that as the clock counts down to Jesus' death, Luke has us constantly looking at the calendar. This is the historic date in, in, in the year of slaughter and sacrifice and substitution. And so what we have here, Luke wants us to know, is not random chance. It is not a one in a million um, coincidence, what we have, Luke says, is careful observance of God's own calendar. Jesus is going to be killed as the Passover lamb that God had said before he would provide and provide it in the place of his people. 
First then, the plot. Here is the stitch up that God had predicted. Secondly, the date. Here is the sacrifice God had pledged. And then thirdly, and lastly, the meal. As Jesus uh, explains, here is the salvation God has planned. And as Luke records for us the astonishing events of what we call the Last uh, Supper, he tells us um, that Jesus does an extraordinary thing. Uh, it, it is a Passover meal that they are eating, and bold as brass, Jesus inserts himself right into the middle of proceedings and, uh, and, and insisting that this meal is actually about him, and it is actually about his death and his body and his blood. And it's clear, isn't it, that we're on the edge of something momentous for Jesus. So verse uh, 16, no more Passover meals for him. In fact, verse uh, 18, no more wine at all until the kingdom of God comes, until Jesus has been enthroned as king of that kingdom, until he has opened that kingdom to others. And his death, Luke wants us to know, is how he will do it. The bread and the wine, you'll see it explained that there are two parts to it. Obviously, just one death, but two aspects to it. And the bread speaks of a ransom, the wine of a relationship, and together, here is the salvation that God had planned. First then, the bread, verse uh, 19. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Just as you had to remember the original Passover sacrifice, so you are to remember mine. But this is my body given for you. Here is the payment of the ransom price. Just as the lamb had been killed as a substitute of, uh, of, of Israel to buy them back from being slaves to Pharaoh by paying the price of God's justice, so in the same way Jesus will be killed as a substitute for his people, buying us back from slavery to sin and to death by paying the price of God's justice. It is a glorious and a remarkable thing. And he does it to bring us back into a right relationship with God. So the wine, verse 20, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Covenant is the Bible's word for a relationship with God. And uh, once again, we're back in the Old Testament. The prophet uh, Jeremiah, among others, had announced that one day God will make with you a new and better covenant. He will enter into uh, with you a new and better relationship. And I, I think I put the verses on the, uh, on the uh, uh, screen, if you can just about read, read, uh, read them or, or follow along. Um, this covenant would be uh, one in which uh, God would ensure that the hearts of his people would no longer be rebellious against him. Second half of verse 33, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. This would be a covenant in which God himself would no longer be a distant uh, stranger. Verse 34, they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. And this will be a covenant founded on the tremendous thing that God would no longer hold his people's sins against them. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sin no more. No more guilt, no more shame, no more fear, no more wrath. 
One day, Jeremiah had said, one day God will bring his people into a relationship with himself that is better than any human being has ever had with the living God, and it will last forever. And Jesus explains this relationship, this new covenant is finally going to go live as he goes to his death. It is hard to do justice in words, isn't it? To just how glorious and wonderful these things are. But Luke wants us to be certain. The plot tells us, Luke says, here is the stitch up God had predicted. The date Luke wants us to know, here is the sacrifice that God had pledged. And as we listen to Jesus' words at the meal, Luke wants us to know, here, this is the salvation God had promised. The death of Jesus is the great rescue God had promised. It is the mighty work of salvation that God always had in mind. Well, as we close then, what difference should these uh, extraordinary things make to us? Well, as uh, Christian believers, these things have come to pass for us, haven't they? Jesus was going to his death for us, whenever I have referred to God's people or to Jesus' people, uh, people um, you can and should insert your own name there. Uh, when Jesus says, this is my body given for, for you, he means given for you, Rue, given for you, uh, 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 Saskia, given for you, John, given for you, whoever you are. When uh, we say that Jesus has brought us into a relationship with God that is better than anyone has ever had before, obeying him, knowing him, forgiven by him, that is you, isn't it? And that's me. And uh, if you are a, a guest here with us uh, this evening, still thinking about these things, that could be you, couldn't it? That could be you, even this evening, why not ask the friends who uh, brought you, or me, or Rue, or, or um, someone. But if we um, return to Luke's primary purpose in telling us all, all, all this, um, because did you notice how in verse 14, Luke refers to Jesus' disciples as his apostles? Uh, in verse 3, they were the 12. In verse 11, they are the disciples. But in verse 14, they are apostles. An apostle is a special um, authoritative messenger. And the, and the 12 are referred to as, a, as, uh, as apostles only a handful of times in Luke's gospel. And each time, it is with a view to evangelism, to the task of mission that gets the green light once Jesus rises from the dead. In other words, the, the Lord's Supper, the uh, last uh, supper, this intensely personal, almost unbearably emotional moment is evangelism training, isn't it? Once we are clear that the death of Jesus is the great rescue God promised, the great work of, of salvation, that is absolutely the thing that God is committed to and is doing. Once we are clear that the death of Jesus is that, well, we have the answer, don't we? Why it is, why it must be so that the death of Jesus is the center of the Christian message. That's why the apostles in the book of Acts, they preach about Jesus in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of, of, of the earth. That's why they preach Christ 
and him crucified. That's why the great missionaries went to the hard and alien and difficult places. That is why the great Mr. Grubb insisted that the death of Jesus had to be front and center. Just listen to the question he actually asked the leader of the SCM. He said, does the SCM put the atoning blood of Jesus Christ central? Once you see that the blood of Jesus is atoning blood, saving blood, God's great rescue blood, it has to be central. And as we look ahead to the next few weeks, to passion for life, but also hopefully to a, a, a lifetime of evangelism that God calls each of us to in, in, in our various ways, um, if we as a generation are those who get it, if we are those who get that the death of Jesus truly is the great rescue God promised, and if um, we appreciate just what a tremendous rescue it is to be forgiven by God, to be brought to know God, to be brought to belong to him, all of it bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and all of it uh, freely, freely available to anyone who will come then we will be a generation who know, in fact, who insist that the death of Jesus is and must always be central to the Christian message. Let me lead us in prayer. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Our gracious Father, we thank you and praise you so much for the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how we thank you that Luke shows us so clearly and so compellingly that it really is the great rescue you had promised. We praise you that the death of Jesus is the great work of salvation that you have accomplished for us and for the world. And we pray, Father, that you'd enable us this evening and always to be sure and certain of these things, to rejoice afresh in Jesus and all that he has done for us. And would you enable us to be confident uh, as we go forward to try to tell others about him, we pray that you would make us confident that truly the death of Jesus is the heart of the message that we believe and that we want to pass on. And we ask it in his name. Amen.